Good afternoon, everybody. How are you doing? Welcome back to Principles of Formation Evaluation, PG 358, Spring 2020. This is Professor Carlos Torres Verdin recording live from the Texas Hill Country over a sea of blue bonnets at our property. I hope you're all happy, safe, healthy, and so are your families. Today, we are going to talk about Shaley Sansons. We are going to talk about the effect of shale on the petrophysical properties of Sansons, and we're going to talk about the effect of shale on the well logs that we acquire across Shaley Sansons. Um, we are going to cover a few slides in PowerPoint, and we're also going to cover a few exercises or or uh, sheets from the compendium of well logs. So, once again, fasten your seat belts and hope you're doing fine. Welcome back to these recordings. Um, we are looking at another page of the compendium, PG358 compendium, well log compendium part one, page 11. Let's look at that. Just wanted to remind you that when we look at well logs, there are different ways to assess whether a, a given sanson unit is or is not shaly. And one of the easiest ways that we talked about is to first of all recognize, indicate, find a sanson unit that is water saturated, like on page. 11 we have this one here and we know that is a sensor because of the gamma ray log as shown here 12,150 we also know that is a sensor because of the response that we have on the resistivity logs and of course we also know that the density log the apparent density log is indicating an increase of porosity. Just to remind you, this, in this example, both the neutron and density logs are expressed in apparent sense and porosity units, like shown here. And the uh, scale goes from 0 to 60, you can read that on your own. And then uh, we also understand from the diagram that the upper part of the log is taken by a sandstone development and the sandstone development is dominantly saturated with hydrocarbons based on all the evidence. But going back to the sandstone with brine, the one that we have at the bottom at 12,150, what we see of course is that the electrical resistivity goes below the shell baseline and characteristically we see that the gamma ray log achieves one of the lowest values possible here but if the sanson were clean then what we would immediately see is that the neutron and density logs would overlap right here at places where we have a local minimum in the gamma ray log so what we do is we find a the lowest value of the gamma ray log for this sensor, and we go across and then we verify whether the neutron and density logs expressed in sensor and process units are overlapping or not. And in this example, they are not. So this immediately flags, brings up a flag saying, be careful, this sensor is not clean. There's no amount of shell. We know that this is a turbidite sedimentary environment let me actually zoom here. And we also know that uh, turbidite systems, they tend to have a significant portion of laminated shell. And when we go through the gamma ray log, we also verify that the gamma ray log indicates oscillation. So we have interbedded shells here. So even though most of what we have here is sensor. There is a non-negligible amount of shell that causes the gamma ray log to increase. Look at the values. They are not 
by any stretch of the imagination negligible. And second, when we look at the neutral and density logs expressed in sensing process units, we see that they not overlap. And more importantly, we see that the distance, the number of process units that go from one of the logs to the other is not negligible. It's, it's actually close to nine process units, given that each one of these each one of these tick marks represents three process units. So it's nine process units difference. And that's not negligible given the fact that this rock has about 33% proxy. So we cannot neglect the presence of shell. So nine divided by 30, which is the the um, 30, 33% proxy units, which is the proxy of these sensor units, then that's, that's, uh, that percent is not negligible. The other thing that we uh, indicated in class is that the gamma ray log is, in most conditions, the gamma ray log is fluid independent and only responds to the solids. So because of this, and because of the fact that this value has already been decided that indicates a shigley sensor, if we go across this example and we encounter equal values of gamma ray log, that, that immediately tells us that all of the units with the same value of gamma ray log will be shaky. So that's, that's important. It says that the presence of shell cannot be neglected. So we have to deal with that. So that was an indication. And what does that happen? Well, first of all, we need to find out in this, when this is important, what we do, what we need to do is we need to find out what is the volumetric concentration of shell. Is this next negligible or is not? So we already know that the process of this sensor is approximately 32%. We did this exercise before. And uh, we know that CSH will be significant if the volumetric concentration of shell is or uh, is, a, is an important fraction compared to the porosity of the rock. So that's something that tells us, uh, be careful, volumetric concentration of shell is not negligible. In other words, if the porosity is 32%, but the volumetric concentration of shell is 1%, maybe is not significant. But if the volumetric concentration of, rock, of shell in the rock is 20%, then it begins to be comparable to 32%. You see? We neglect or do not neglect depending on the relationship between the volumetric concentration of shell and the process. We have to be careful with that. Okay. And uh, the second point that goes in the analysis is that obviously the we're not very, very interested in producing fluids from the water saturated sensor, but this difference has already indicated to us that we have to be careful because if the values of gamma ray log that we find here are comparable to the values of gamma ray log that we observe in the hydrocarbon saturated portion of the sensor, then we also need to make corrections before calculating all of the storage and um, flow properties of these sensors. The other thing that is very, very interesting in this example, and that's what I wanted to point out, is that as we climb up on this example, the upper part, uh, that is to say, at depths higher, uh, shallower than 11,950 feet below the uh, reference level, the gamma ray log begins to increase on average. And so even though, and what does that mean? Well, it means that the volumetric concentration of shell begins to increase at the top. And what happens at the same time is that the resistivity law, the resistivity logs begin to exhibit lower values than they had with in comparison to places where the gamma ray log was much lower, like here. That's exactly what you expect as the effect of shell in sensors. The other thing that we see is that the 
crossover between neutron and density locks begins to be suppressed in the presence of shell to the point that when the volumetric concentration of shell reaches the maximum that we see here, which is still uh, not a shell, but it's a sensor, the uh, resistivity has decreased almost to the value that we see in the shell baseline. But look, now the neutron and density locks, despite the fact that this is a hydrocarbon saturated sensor, actually it's a gas saturated sensor, we don't see a crossover. What does it mean? Well, it just means that the volumetric concentration of shell is so large here that despite the fact that we have hydrocarbons, the um, neutron and density logs look like as though this was a shell. So we have to, if we want to understand what are the storage and flow properties of the interbated sensors that we have in this sequence, we have to make corrections for the volumetric concentration of shell. That's another example. All right. Now, if we go now to page, let's go to page 23. This is another beautiful example of Shaley Sansons. Let me modify the, uh, the display. And uh, once again, we're looking at page 23 of the compendium, page 23. This uh, page 23 is interesting because it's another very um, important laminated, shell laminated sequence. In this particular case, we're looking at a deltaic sedimentary sequence. This is offshore the coast of Egypt. Very interesting. The one thing that is interesting here is that uh, gamma ray log, in comparison to the previous example, exhibit many more oscillations than, or um, yeah, many more oscillations per unit depth than the previous example. The values of gamma ray log are also different. The range of values is different. And we also have indications from the resistivity log that the lower portion of this development, below 10,000 feet measure depth, is water saturated. In fact, it is a burn. Whereas the upper part, the starting at 10,000 feet measure depth and shallower, going up on the display, that's a sequence that is all hydrocarbon saturated. That's interesting, isn't it? Because look, if we look at the neutron and density logs of the sequence, we're going to see that in many cases, where the volumetric concentration of shell is high because the gamma ray log is high, we have lower values of resistivity and the crossover that would be expected from the neutron and density logs is no longer there, despite that we have hydrocarbons. So that's another example of how presence of shell gives rise to abnormal behavior and the uh, neutron density resistivity logs. If this sequence were clean, full of hydrocarbons, then what would happen, of course, is that the gamma ray log will be low, as low as possible. Second, the resistivity values will be high. And third, we would see a nice crossover between neutron and density logs. I remind you that in this example, both neutron and density logs are expressed in Sanson cross units, which is what we what we need in a uh, Silicyclastic sedimentary sequence. So that's all good. And when we go about this example, let me go on page to, to show you something interesting on page 27. Page 27 has an enlargement of whole core as indicated by the um, photographs that we have. One of these is a direct photograph and the second one is ultraviolet photograph. And what this shows, very interesting, is uh, first of all the beds are dipping at an angle, that's what we see in the photograph here. And second, we realize that for one foot of distance, let's say this 9860 to now 9861, this foot, we see a significant amount of sandstone shell laminations. 
So uh, that's an indication that despite the fact that we have hydrocarbons here, the sequence, sequence is uh, shell laminated and because of that all the well logs are going to be affected by the presence of shell. So if we want to estimate the storage and flow properties of the um, sandstones that are included in this sequence, we have to first of all calculate the volumetric concentration of shell that we have and second of all we need to make corrections to all the logs uh, the resistivity log the neutral and density logs and so forth and so on and then after making the corrections we can calculate what is first of all the porosity of the intervening sensors or sensor layers and second the hydrocarbon saturation of the intervening sensors and subsequently the permeability of the intervening sensors. Let's look at another example. This time we're going to be looking at the examples that we uh, did in class. This example, let me clean up the test here. This example over here is an example that I distributed in class, but it's also pages, uh, one of the first few pages of the compendium part two. So this is a compendium part two. And this example is actually included in that compendium. If you flip through the pages, it will be pages uh, two and three. But when we started the lectures here, the first thing I did is that I show you or I plotted the logs for you in a consolidated fashion like shown here. So we have that. What I want to point out again is uh, a few things about the presence of shell and the way in which presence of shell manifests itself in the logs. So first of all, we recognize the gamma ray log over here. Um, the largest values, the lowest values over here. Uh, we also recognize the resistivity logs, the super shallow, the medium, and the deep. And here we have the neutron and density logs, apparent density and neutron process logs expressed in sense and process units. And this is the sonic log. What we see is very, very interesting. First of all, I hope you remember that for the largest values of gamma ray log, we identify that these units are shells, and we know that because the resistivity logs do not exhibit signs of invasion. We also see the maximum separation between neutron and density logs, where the neutron log is, has larger values than the density log. And um, we also see that the gamma ray log has the largest values. Those are the three signs. As we go along this upper section, we see that we have shells. Maybe the shell properties are not the same because the resistivity is not the same. The gamma ray log is about the same, but also the uh, separation and values of the neutron and density logs are not the same. At the bottom of this sequence, we encounter another segment of a shell. And then we encounter a section here, which is mostly a sandstone sequence with some oscillations present in the gamma ray log, which indicate interbedded shells, but mostly a sensor sequence. And then that gives us an indication of what is the lowest value gamma ray log, which we can identify here. Now, so the question is for these lower lowest value gamma ray log, do we have a clean or not clean sensor? And the way we do it, as we indicated in class, is that we go to the lowest values of gamma ray log, and then we go across the uh, scale here in depth and we look at neutron and density logs expressed in sense and for units. And we find that for those, those local minima, the neutron and density logs overlap. Uh, and understanding that this is water saturated, then we effectively find out that these, uh, for those segments where the gamma ray log is a minimum, we have a clean sensor. Please compare this um, example to the first one that I showed today, in which case 
for even the lowest values you can relog, log we did not have an overlap in fact the neutron and density logs were such that the neutron exhibited larger values in the density log so that was a sign that all the sensors in that example were shaky but in this example we see that the overlap so therefore the uh, interpreted shell sensors that we have here can be assumed to be clean so we can use arches equation you can we can use all of the techniques that we have developed so far in class all right and so we go higher up we understand that the gamma ray log is fluid independent so anywhere we see the same value of gamma ray log across the example here we can rest assured that those are clean sensors because we already have the indication coming from the water saturated sensor so you see the water saturated sensor serves the purpose of giving us verification of shell free or not shell free okay now we know that this uh, sequence is hydrocarbon saturated in fact we have first of all oil then we have gas over here we have invasion all these sensors are permeable and then what happens here is the most interesting part here over at 5520 actually 5530 we have something interesting at that point the gamma ray log begins to increase in value it has a tendency to increase in value approaching the values of the shell and then what do we see well what we see is that the resistivity values decrease and we also see that the neutron density crossover decreases so the separation decreases compared to what we have here that's the effect of shell in fact at some point the uh, volumetric concentration of shell is, is increasing so high so large so uh, high values that the resistivity logs are almost very close to the shell baseline and second look at this the crossover between neutron and density logs has gone we don't see a crossover that would manifest presence of light hydrocarbons when in fact this section over here is loaded with gas so what happened well what happens here is that the volumetric concentration of shell has increased to such high values that is masking the presence of sensors and that's that's important because you were naive about this then we will say this is not producible and that's not true because if the um, interpreted sensors that we have here if they have good proxy and good permeability and we already know that they're hydrocarbon saturated well they can be produced of course the production of these hydrocarbons with high volumetric concentration of shell in the form of laminated shell will not be the same as the production of the uh, fluids in the sensors over here because the sensors in the part where we see a magnificent crossover then uh, they are cleaner fewer laminations of shell and because of that they are easier to produce also because here we have um, more dominance of shell lamina then the sequence over here is going to be anisotropic anisotropic for electrical resistivity anisotropic for permeability and anisotropic for permeability but guess what despite the fact that we have intervening shells here all of the sensors that we have in this sequence sandwich in this sequence all of them are hydraulically communicated so if you produce them you can produce them holistically so to speak so what happens here is that all of the things that we have uh, developed so far in the course using Arch's equation calculation of porosity and so forth so on they could they will work extremely well in this section over here because everything is clean but they will not work in this section we have to apply a different method to be able to assess all of the storage and for flow properties of the sensors that we have in this sequence before we can um, assess whether this segments or segment of the sequence is financially viable uh, and how do we do that well okay so 
be before we go into that direction, and that's the subject of today's presentation, I just wanted to say something, which is the following. And this is a very simple rule to understand how this um, presence of shell is going to affect the locks. All right. What I want you to see is the following. Okay, so we have already found what a clean sandstone would look like in terms of gamma ray lock, resistivities, neutron and density locks. Okay, now that let's take that as an example. Of course, even if it's clean, when you have different hydro, different fluid saturating the sandstones, we will have different values of resistivity. That's what Archie tells us, and also we will find different values for the neutron and density locks because of the presence of light fluids or fluids lighter than water. But here's the thing. If you take any of these sensors and you begin to sort of sprinkle to add shell lamina, what happens? The easy way to understand what happens is, first of all, let's look at what the locks behave like in a pure shell. So let's say that this is a pure shell. In the pure shell, we have the maximum values of gamma ray lock. In a pure shell, we have the values of the shell baseline for electrical resistivity. Okay, that's constant in this example, it's almost one ohmmeter right here. And then we have maximum separation between neutron and density logs, where the neutron log exhibits the largest values of apparent porosity compared to the density porosity log. You see, that's what you expect. That's a pure shell. Let's call this a pure shell. So let's take that as reference. So then what happens when I'm here and this beautiful hydrocarbon gas saturated clean sandstone and I begin to sprinkle it with shell. So what happens here is that depending on the amount of, of the volumetric concentration of shell that I sprinkle in these sensors, all the logs, gamma ray log, resistivity, neutron density, they will have the tendency to approach the values that we see in the pure shell. See, the pure shell serves as reference. Look at this. As we go up, the volumetric concentration of shell increases, the gamma ray log approaches that of the pure shell. You see that? The trend is important in this example. Now, what, hap what happens next? Electrical resistivity. An increase in the volumetric concentration decreases the resistivity because, in the end, the resistivity logs will behave just like a pure shell. That's a tendency. And what happens with the neutron and density logs? Well, the tendency is, in the end, in the limit when the volumetric concentration of shell is 1, that is to say we're in a pure shell, then the tendency will be like this. So look what happens. We go from here, maximum separation, beautiful yellow highlighted section, sprinkle more shell, crossover decreases, gone, and maximum. That's what we expect. So with this example, just please note that that's what we expect in the presence of shells. And depending on the amount of shell and the type of shell, uh, we will have a fast or slow tendency toward the sense of behave of a cure shell. And if we're not careful, we can uh, be misguided and discard zones like this. But with the analysis that we're going to do, I'm going to show you how to calculate, quantify the storage and flow properties of these rocks so that you can, with quantitative tools, you can assess whether this is negligible or not from a financial point of view. Okay, so uh, that's the subject of today's presentation. That was my introduction. And subsequently, I'm going to show you a few more details about this and we're going to conduct an exercise to go over the mechanics of the calculations. And I also want to know, uh, some of the students were very nice and told me that uh, gave me a few suggestions to improve the quality of light. So now we have a lamp. I hope that the quality of these uh, renderings is a little bit better. Excellent. Thank you.